Hey everybody and welcome back. This is the first day of unit three. So we're going to be looking at polynomials is the name of the unit, but it's going to include cubic functions and then a couple of other different types of functions as well. And we're going to talk about polynomials as a general item and a lot of different things going on about it. So in today, we're just going to look at cubic functions specifically. So what are the characteristics of them? Um, what are the effects of transformations on a cubic function? And then we're going to write the equation of cubic functions from graphs. So very similar to how we started quadratics, where we talked about the transformations, we talked about the characteristics of the actual graph itself, and then we learned how to write the equation given certain key points on the graph. Almost the exact same start for each of our units, and then it branches off into its unique characteristics and things that you can do. Essential questions for today, what are the key parts and features of a cubic function? So what do we need to know about? And then how do I write the equation of a cubic function from a given point of symmetry and another point? And by the end, you should know what point of symmetry means as well. So in the last lesson, we, you know, we, we finalized unit two. So we completed the unit on quadratics. We did solving linear and nonlinear systems. And then we also just kind of introduced the equation of circles very quickly. So you would be able to answer questions based on that. All right. So looking at cubic functions, what we got. The graph shown here is the graph of y equals x cubed. So this is what a most basic cubic function looks like. So this is the parent function for a cubic function. Um, graph goes up in this kind of sideways S shape. It, um, you know, as we add more things in, it might resemble more of an N. But sideways S is another way of thinking about it. Um, notice that it starts from negative infinity, goes up to positive infinity. So this is just what the parent version of it looks like. Um, as we add in different transformations, you will notice different things. There is a point at the center of the function. This is called your point of symmetry. So your point of symmetry, it is, um, it's a point symmetry. So it's one where if you rotate the graph 180 degrees around that point, it rotates onto itself. Or if you reflect it over a line going vertically through it and horizontally through it, the reflections would line up with each other. So we've got a point of symmetry. And then there's usually these two points, one unit to the right, one unit to the left, that we call reference points. And these are what we use usually to tell what the A value is. So what is the vertical stretch or compression? Uh, let me create some space here. So the way of writing cubic equations. We've got our standard forms so where we can see the vert. Oh, it's not the vertex anymore. So now this is going to be H and K are the point of symmetry. Um, so H still being right, left, K being up, down, A being the um, vertical stretch or compression. And then we have standard form, which is the AX cubed, BX squared, CX, and D. So there's now an additional um, X value and raised to a cube as opposed to X squared being the highest. Um, you will also see it in factored form. So, you know, that's something that we've seen in quadratics. We'll see it in almost all polynomials. So you could have like X plus one, X minus two, X plus three. So you would have three factors for a cubic function. Um, so in the case of the diagram given over here, it's X cubed. So it would be X times X times X. So three X is multiplied with um, zero being the second value. Things to watch out for. You're going to need to be able to tell domain and range. So I already kind of hinted at the idea that the parent function for cubics has a domain of negative infinity, positive infinity. So everything from X from pop negative infinity all the way to positive infinity range. Same thing from the left though. It starts at negative infinity and then it goes up to positive infinity. So just kind of keeping that in mind, what the um, end behavior is going to look like as well. Uh, the intercepts and zeros you're going to need to be able to figure out. Now, at the moment, there's only one intercept or one zero. Um, as we start delving into a couple of different types of cubics, you will notice that n shapes start to come out. And if it's hitting the axis, there could be potentially three zeros. So notice we go up to a power of three, and now suddenly there are three zeros, whereas x squared had potential for a max of two zeros. Um, not a coincidence, the more, um, the higher the exponent on X, the more zeros you are going to have as well, potentially. You don't have to have them, but you can certainly go up to a higher number. 
uh, we want to know about turning points. So again, not hard to see on this current graph. I'll give you another one in a second. That'll be easier to see. But when you do have that more defined end shape, we're going to have these turning points. The number of turning points is usually going to be one less than the highest exponent of x. So if you have an x cubed, there's going to be two turning points. If the highest one is x squared, so thinking quadratic, there's only one turning point. If it's just a linear function, so x to the power of 1, there are no turning points. And then you would expect if we go up to x to the power of 4, it would have 1, 2, 3 turning points. So we'll get this kind of m and w shape. So yeah, those are some things to just kind of keep an eye out for. Like what is the um, shape? How many turning points are there? How many zeros are there? What are the intercepts? Um, is there a symmetry going on? So are they even odd or neither? So a cubic function, we just kind of said was an odd function because if you reflect it over the x-axis and the y-axis, it will reflect onto itself. But as soon as you start adding in transformations, that may no longer be true. Um, there should still be a symmetry in there unless you are really messing with it but keep an eye out for what it looks like. So be expecting it to change. And the end behavior, you know, what, what, are the, what is the X and Y value doing as you go to the extremes of the graph? So keep an eye out on that and start trying to recognize patterns along the way. The reference points I already talked about, those are kind of your first coordinates that you will see that are usually whole number coordinates that can help us to find the value of A, so the vertical stretch or compression. So you see, notice the graph just changed. Um, we've got just a more, there's, there's more to this um, function. So it's no longer just x cubed. So now you've got turning points. We would also call those local. So in this case, the one down here is a local min and local max. So we, we will be asked sometimes, what are the coordinates of the turning points, or what's the, the coordinate of the local minimum, or at what value of x is there a local max, stuff like that. So just be aware of that. The point of symmetry, so this is still a symmetrical cubic function. It's, you know, it would be halfway between the min and the max. It would be, you know, if you could find equal points, it'd be halfway between those. It's like somewhere around here. So that if you reflected it um, over x and over y, it would reflect onto itself or rotate 180 degrees. All right, so transformations, there's not really anything new here. You've got your parent function is x cubed, the transform function, we've got the a, h, and k values. Sometimes there will be a b. Um, for the most part in this part of algebra two, we are ignoring the b value, but remember it's one over b, x minus h to be cubed. So there is a b value that can be there, but it's hard to tell the difference between a vertical stretch and a horizontal compression. So we just typically will stick to the A value. So A is vertical stretch compression, H is translation, and so is K. So nothing different from quadratics. Your job is going to be to identify transformations and then write equations given certain transformations. So let's, let's just do a quick practice. Uh, describe how the graph of G of X is related to the parent function F of X. So you would say, okay, what will be different about them? And use your transformation vocabulary. So what are the transformations essentially and how will that change the shape of the graph? Try it on your own and then come back and see how you did. Okay, so when we look at the first one, we've got a value of a half. It looks like the h value is zero because it would be a half x minus zero or x plus zero cubed plus two. So the h value is zero. And then k value is plus two, and we've got an a value of a half. So we've got a vertical compression. Of a half, we've got a translation up two units. So the vertical compression of a half, you know, instead of it being like a, a more steep kind of end shape, it's going to be a little bit wider. So it's going to like kind of curve a little bit more, take its time and then go up. That's pretty much what you'll notice if you type that in your calculator, just to see, okay, what does it look like or put in Desmos. Second one, 
x minus 5 to be cubed. The only thing that's in here that's different to the original is the minus 5. So minus h equals minus 5. The h value is positive 5. So this is going to translate 5 units right. And the last one, we've got a little bit of everything. So we've got an a value of 3. So we've got a vertical stretch. I have factor of three. So remember to include the details of the transformation. Also vertical stretch by um, factor of three. Translation, and you can combine your two translations. So you can say translation um, x plus one is going to be left one unit. Oh, I put units, one unit. And then minus 11 is down 11. Okay, moving on. So we did this with quadratics where I gave you the coordinate of the vertex and I gave you one other point on the quadratic and I said write the equation of the quadratic. And you subbed in the vertex for h and k and then you took that other point, you subbed that in for x and y and then you solve for a. It is the exact same steps here except h and k are the point of symmetry, not the vertex. So when we go to solve this, our h and our k value are given to us as 2, 1. And then I can pick either of the other two points as my x, y. It'll work for either one. So I'm just going to take 3, 4. So point of symmetry is at 2, 1. So this is our h and k. And my second point that I'm going to use is 3, 4. So just once again, you can use either of them. It will work, but just pick one. Um, you do have to use the point of symmetry, though. You can't use 3, 4 and 1, negative 2 to make this work. So you sub in the values that you know. So 4 is equal to a times 3 minus 2 cubed plus 1. 4 is equal to a times 3 minus 2 is 1. 1 cubed is just 1 plus 1. So 4 equals a plus 1. a is 3. So then you go back up to your equation back to x and y, y is equal to 3 times x minus 2 cubed plus 1. That's it. So same steps for quadratics, just making sure you know which points you are using to do it. All right, so take a shot. Um, here's two different examples. You've got the vertex and you've got the um, other point. So for the first one, it's the same as our example that we just had. I want you to practice with the other point. So use one negative two this time and verify that we get the same answer. And then for the second one, it's a brand new one. Try it out yourself. See how you do. All right, welcome back. So we've got y equals. So instead of y, we're going to have minus two equals a times We've got 1 is x, h value is 2, so 1 minus 2 cubed, and then plus 1. Minus 2 equals a. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Negative 1 cubed is going to be a negative 1, so negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1. So minus 2 equals minus a plus 1. Subtract the 1 from both sides minus 3 is equal to minus a, divide by negative 1, 3 is equal to a. So we still get y equals 3 times x minus 2 squared plus 1. So exact same answer popping out here. Going over to the other side. So h is minus 6, k is negative 1. Um, there are larger numbers in this case, so it's, it's going to be a little bit bigger. I'm just going to go with the one on top. So we've got x and y. So we've got 17 is equal to a times x is minus 9, h is minus 6, so plus 6 cubed, and then k is minus 1. So I'm going to start using some of the space over here. 17 is equal to a times minus 9 plus 6 is negative 3 cubed. And then we got minus 1. 
um, add one to both sides. So we get 18 is equal to um, three cubed. So three times three is nine times three is 27 and it's going to be negative. So minus 27 a. So then divide both sides by minus 27. We get 18 over minus 27 is equal to a. And you just simplify that. Uh, they are both divisible by three. So that would be um, six over nine. So they're both divisible by nine. That's where I go actually. So we would have minus two thirds is equal to a. And notice that we would expect it to be negative because a normal cubic would go from left to right, but this one goes from right to left. So it means that it has been reflected vertically. So that a value is negative. So that's something we should have looked for at the beginning and pointed out. Uh, y is equal to minus two thirds x plus six cubed minus one. Done. How'd you do? All right, that brings us to the end of today. So short lesson, but you've got some new stuff to practice and work on. Um, by the end of today, you should be able to do the rest of the folder. This one does not have a digital option, so you're going to be doing textbook work and submitting pictures of your work. So please make sure you are labeling the page, putting the qu um, question number down, and showing your work. Um, essential questions, what are the key parts of the cubic function? We've got the point of symmetry, another reference point, the kind of general end shape that we're expecting to see. Um, it can have anywhere from one to three roots. So given that it's got that end shape, it's going to go forever, you know, up and down. So it has an infinite range, meaning that we should always have at least one root. Um, it's not like a quadratic where you can have all imaginary solutions because a quadratic looped back on itself. So it was possible for it to not hit the x-axis. A cubic is not possible for that to happen. So you're always going to have at least one real solution. Um, how do I write the equation? You take the point of symmetry, call that your h and k value. You take any other point on the graph and you call that your x and y, and then you solve for the a value using that point of symmetry form. Talk to you all very soon.